subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that they used to mention a story of us about Marabat al Hajj, that there was a slight difference of opinion of the Qibla. And Marabat al Hajj would pray this direction that he thought the Qibla was, and there was this very rude man, I don't know what he was thinking, that one time moved Marabat in prayer. And he moved back. And he moved him again, and he moved back. And then when he sent his salams and the Maliki way, the Malikis put their hands to the side, Assalamu alaikum. And their prayer's over. You don't have to wait for them to say, Wa rahmatullah. I've actually been, there was actually a friend who was telling me that when he's very stern Maliki days, he w led the prayer in the mosque. And he said, Assalamu alaikum. And the entire congregation behind him just stayed there and didn't know what to do. Right? And just stayed there because they were used to everyone saying, Wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. He just said, Assalamu alaikum. And Finally, that their imam, their normal imam, sent salams, and everyone else sent their salams. They weren't used to. Him. Just a small joke. Uh, <laughs> it is a, that is the dominant opinion in the magic school. You just say assalamu alaikum, and your prayer is uh, uh, finished. Um, even in the Shafi school, that if that were all you to do, that it's not an obligation to say wa rahmatullah. In the Shafi school, were you to just go assalamu alaikum, that you fulfilled the obligation in your prayers. You don't have to do wa rahmatullah. It's recommended to do wa rahmatullah. It's recommended to do the second testimony to the left. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Anyhow, that, um, that he sent his salam, assalamu alaikum, and he turns to the man and he says, if you want me to swear an oath by Allah that I see the Kaaba in front of me, I will. You're moving me to the side, I see the Kaaba right in front of me. And you're moving me to the side. And I heard this, you know, this is, this is an established story. Now, this is khabar, Imam Marabat al-Hajj is either telling the truth or he's not telling the truth. Audhu billah, hasha lillah. And uh, there's story after story. These are just things that are coming to my mind right now. With this one individual, there's numerous stories. That there's one of his close students by the name of Abdurrahman. And that uh, he was on his deathbed in Nawakshat. And Marabat al-Hajj is 500 kilometers east in the middle of the Saharan Desert. And that before Fajr, is that while everyone thinks that he's sleeping, then his, in, in his, in when he's laying down, he goes, <coughs> Abdurrahman, like that. And it happened to be, they asked the people in Nawakshat, right when he passed away, it was just before Fajr. How did he know that 500 kilometers away, <coughs> Abdurrahman, that Allah Ta'ala had taken his life, such that he uttered his name like that, SubhanAllah. And if you don't believe in that, then, then, I mentioned the story at our retreat as well. Is that that uh, Shakamza when he wrote the obituary of of Marabat al-Hajj's wife, Maryam, is that Shakamza had mentioned that he had seen Marabat al-Hajj more than once in his dream before meeting him, and the very first time that he met him, he comes into his presence, and Marabat al-Hajj, and he actually Shakamza in real life was like, you know, this is like the dream, and Marabat al-Hajj just before doing, just without him saying anything puts his hand on his shoulder and says, was it like the dream? Inshallah. How do you explain that? What is that? The, if that doesn't give you yaqeen and certainty, what would give you certainty? Right? These are, and it's one thing like, oh, this is just a story. Right? But if you would take someone, this is why it's so important to write biographies. Right? It's so important to write biographies of living ulama. That if you would take someone like Sheikh Noor Keller and write down all of the miracles and things that it's impossible for science to explain, that he himself has seen from his teachers, many are rich reading in a book that even if someone is not from the Shadri Tariqa, that, that everyone that should, read, um, that should read the recent book that was published, um, That Sea Without Shore. And that, that's an amazing book for everyone to read, even if someone doesn't adhere to the Shadri school that in read about the experiences of Sheikh Abu, Abu, Abu Abdul Wakil al-Durubi and Sheikh Abdul Rahman al shughuri and the other great scholars that he took from and the stories that are associated with him let alone that the stories that kind of get out from his students that know things about him that, that just, you know, get it to ask Sheikh Faraz some of these stories that they'll come out, um, Omar knows many of these stories these are living people right, take someone like Dr. Omar Farooq Abdullah these are living people so if you're not going to believe in the stories of the people that came before that get them out of people that are still alive. And if you travel to the Muslim world, and this is why it's still so important, this ridiculous the way that we just to really drive this point home, that people think there is this idea that, yes, we have to do it for ourselves here in the West, which, I'm, I understand what we mean by that. 
is that we are here in our context, and yes, that we have to take into consideration what we need to do here to do what is best for our people. But we will always be indebted to the East. Still in our quest to do what we need to do here, we have to have a connection to the East. That w one of the greatest things that you can do to revive your Iman is that sometimes we have these insoluble problems that, that you, you, you've just gotten in a certain way of being that you can't get out of it, or you're down, you're depressed, or you're, you're unmotivated, and nothing seems to work, no matter what you do. Well, sometimes you just have to go take, make Umrah. Sometimes you have to go to a special place in the Muslim world, like Fez, or like Tarim, or many of the other beautiful pockets that still exist of traditional societies. And you go and you visit the righteous, you visit their graves, yes, you visit their graves, right? And understand that the awliya are the mahat karimillah, they are the way and the means through which the Allah Taala distributes His generosity here in the earth, and you will find that oftentimes those things are removed. Sheikh Hamza mentioned a story to me that he said that there was one time a man whose son had just was not interested in the deen at all, and he basically forced him to come with him to Mauritania. He brings him to Marabu Dahaj, which that's a difficult place to take someone who's not really interested in the deen, and that he met Marabu Dahaj one time, and Marabu Dahaj made a dua for him. And he said, literally, he completely changed as a result of that trip, in one trip. Now, it might not happen miraculously like that, or it might. But the point is that these things are very, very real. And that the more you experience these types of things, is that the more certainty you will have. And you will move from this level of knowledge of certainty to Ayn al-Yaqeen, where there's an eye of certainty, where it's more experiential. Even though when we talk about the eye of certainty, it's more related to your own internal state and what you're witnessing. But then there's even a higher level of that, which is the level of certainty of the Siddiqeen, which is the Haqqad Yaqeen.